All right, so you go by Johnny. Yes. Okay. Do you go by Johnny Mac? So funny. So my legal last name is McCadlow. Okay. And so I worked for a car family car dealership for 19 years. Yeah that that was that was the start of my that was the start of my like sales career. I started living out of my car. Really. At 18 years old, selling cars. And what they did was when I would do TV, I would say, "Hey, this is John McCadlow with such and such." And a popular local DJ goes, "Listen, your name's kind of rough to understand." He's like, "Let's just call you Johnny Mac, dude." And so now everybody, I laugh because people call me Mr. Mac, and anybody close to me just calls me John. But okay. like, we'll call it like fans or business acquaintances will will call me Johnny. <laughs> is it kind of funny that as you have fans and and like, isn't that cool? It's kind of cool. You know what's so funny is <laughs> when, uh, so I, I grew up in Connecticut. Okay. You know, I lived there, you know, until I was 40. And, uh, while well, I'm dating myself. Uh, I lived there until he's I was lying. 40. He's, he's like 30. He's like 30. <laughs> and and I, I lived there until I was 40. And I did local TV for, uh, it was like 19 years because I worked in car dealerships. And um, everybody knew me. And so what was weird was when I got into the sneaker business, which which really funny is my brother, who's actually 20 years younger than me, founded the business. And I thought it was the most silly thing. I ever. read that. I, so, I thought it was the silliest concept ever. Is he still involved? Yes. Okay. So it, it was. Just, I thought it was the silliest thing ever. And I said, listen, I'll be employee number one. I'll get you going. I'll run the company. And uh, we'll, we'll get into that. But yeah, anyway, so now as the business grew... I can go into almost any city and everybody knows, oh, it's Johnny Mac, that's a sneaker guy. And I think that's the craziest thing ever. It's or, cool as hell. I mean, oh, it's it's the best feeling in the world to I mean, this month will be only three years that Impossible Kicks has been open. So that's what I saw. I saw you guys start in twenty twenty one. Is that three correct? years ago ne next week. Three years ago next week. Next week. So by the time this episode airs, you'll be pretty much celebrating your three year anniversary. Correct. And you've went from zero to About six, sixty million in revenue. In revenue, we're like really hoping that we can get to like a hundred million this year. Right. Listen, I mean, there's no the sky's the limit. You're I, in, I, you're I know in you're going to challenge me and bet me something. I'm going to have to do it. You're so. in a market <laughs> that is growing and growing like crazy. I mean, yeah. this is one of the. So I, I, I obviously asked a bunch of questions on yeah. my social media. Did you get some? Did you get some good ones? What's that? Uh, yeah, you know, it was really funny. Like, you know, a lot of people ask about like starting their own business, okay. what it takes to be an entrepreneur, um, you know, uh, male supplements. Okay. You know, a li little bit of everything, a little bit of health, a little bit of business. That's cool. Yeah, which I think is cool because that's kind of both our wheelhouse. Yeah. So, well, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I like, I like that, uh, you know, I like everybody's idea of what business really could be. And I like how people can just make anything into a business. Like, people talk about opportunities. People talk about, like, oh, well, you know, how do I get into a business? Your brother got you into selling shoes, and now you own the fourth largest resale company, resale company in the world. Yeah, on the planet. It's it's so wild when I actually discuss it because when I tell people about it because my brother knew everything about it, and sure. I used to make fun of him because he used to sell sneakers out of the back of my parents' trunk. <laughs> and so he's like, I saved up some money, mm -hmm. and he's like, I want to open it, but I don't know know how to do a lease. Sure. So I'll never forget calling Taubman Properties, Kathy Lloyd's house. I was like, yeah, listen, I got this concept. My brother has this company. No deck, no nothing. Just like pitched. And she goes, that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> so we literally opened. And the first day we opened, I had never sold a sneaker before. Mm -hmm. So I had this new employee that was behind my left shoulder. Every time I would like see a sneaker, I go, well, this is beautiful. What is this? Yeah. He goes, oh, you know, Jordan 6 Cardinal. Oh, this is great. <laughs> and I would open up and look at it. I completely faked it. So, you know, I hired an authenticator. Mm -hmm. You know, my brother knew sneakers. And there was a, essentially me. Now, where'd you, you know, guys source these in the beginning? Like, how, did you did you have to <sighs> make deals? Or how or were you guys, like, hunting? You guys were hunting. That's a cool story. Yeah? So, yeah. So, what, what we would do is... Uh, we literally would go on offer up. So my brother knew how to get some sneakers. And then when I finally got involved with it, I started going on offer up. Sure. And I'll never forget, I was buying like sneakers off crackheads at Wendy's. Bro. So like you would message them like, yeah, meet me at Wendy's. And they'd be like scratching themselves. I'd be like, yo, what am I doing? What am I doing here? You're, like meeting one person for one. You know, because he had a lot of stuff, but I kind of said, well, what if we were able to 
Because the whole concept, what gave me the idea was there was this girl I knew, and she goes, hey, listen, do you know where I can get these sneakers for my boyfriend? I want to get a matching pair with him. Sure. But there's nothing that accommodates women. So I said, wow, let me come up with a concept that's 50% men, 50% women, and kind of have the inventory diverse enough where everybody can kind of come and get a little something for everyone. What's your diversity uh, mix in, in the shop, do you think? It's 48% women. 48% women. 52% men, 48% women. And uh, demographic from 18 years old to 47. But, I mean, I can't tell you how many times, like, you know, grandpa at 75, 80 years old comes in and gets Yeezys. Really? Yeah. It's Everybody wants to be trained. And you know what, like, one of our biggest markets is women over 35. Sure. Well, Huge. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm 38. Yeah. These shoes, a lot of these shoes are like kind of nostalgic to me. A lot of the Jordans, a lot of this is all, this is what we grew up with, you know? Yeah. I mean, you aren't too far in age. No. So like, did, were you a sneaker head? Like, did you like shoes before? Or well, were you just not really like as into them? <laughs> how, how it actually happened was, um, I got out of the auto industry um, the beginning of 2020, mm -hmm. like right when COVID shut down. And uh, I had worn a suit every day for 23 years in the auto industry. And mm -hmm. I, had, I had a beautiful wardrobe. And my brother, I was that like tool of a guy that would wear like jeans and like dress shoes. Okay. My brother's like, what are you doing? You know, he's like, you got to get some sneakers. It was sure. COVID too. Sure, sure. So we got a couple pairs and I got hooked. And that was kind of my introduction. So I had no sneakers and then I had a bunch of sneakers. What, what's your, all right, so this is going to, yeah, we're going to put you on a spot. Of course. What's your favorite brand personally? Like what's your favorite to put on your foot? You're wearing Adidas today. Yeah, this Some is kind of cool. Some super cool corn this, Adidas, by the way. Yeah, yeah. You want to know? I love the band Corn. You know, I've probably seen them like seven or eight times live. They're 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 great. So I thought that was just, they were yeah. so cool. So I had to wear these. But super my safe. favorite is Jordan Ones. Okay, my absolute favorite. And the reason why I liked it is because you know my, I came from lower middle class. Sure. My parents worked their ass off, but you know we never really had super nice things. Same. So when I was able to get a couple pairs of Jordan Ones, I was like. It was kind of like a liberating thing. I felt like I was in high school and the cool kid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, when well, yeah. you got a new pair of sneakers in high school, it was like the big thing, oh, right? It was... I had a pair of Nike Airs in the late 80s when they first came out. Oh, I thought I was the coolest guy ever. <laughs> I mean, when we were getting Jordans, my brother and I, you know, who's back here behind the camera, yeah. <laughs> when we were getting our Jordans originally back in the day, it was like, you got, when you walk in a basketball court with Jordan, you felt like Jordan. It was yeah. a different time. You yep. know what I mean? There was like, It was before internet, before all that stuff. Like, you were showing out. Not on Instagram. You're showing out at the basketball court. You're showing out at school. Yeah. And the sneakers were a huge thing, you know? Huge. And I mean, the, the brands were so diverse, and Nike has just really consumed a lot of that market share. Sure. You know, Adidas is actually, I think, really making a comeback. And there's, we call them, bad shoes have been so popular, like New Balance, Asics is popular yep. again. What's a Champion? I saw Champion re recently. What is that about? Even Reebok. Reebok, the pump is coming back out. Really? I, I think I'm going to get a pair. You know? Are you? I think it's just so Listen, cool. Listen, if you get a pair, you're an influencer. Gonna, gonna, no, Listen, I, you're you're a shoe influencer. <laughs> you might actually get this thing popping. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm going to get you a pair, so we'll get matching pairs. We'll get matching but, pairs? Yeah, but I think it's just, so, it's just so cool. I mean, and everybody's into nostalgia now. Yeah. And if you think about it, when we were 20, sure. everybody from the 80s was really popular again. You know, Motley Crue and Poison oh, yeah. and all those. Oh, yeah. Now, a good friend of mine and customer, uh, Joey Fatone from NSYNC, yep. 20 years ago. He's, he know, lives right here. Yeah. yeah. Greatest guy ever. Oh, yeah. Great guy. And um, he actually, uh, you know, they're trying to put an NSYNC tour together. Everybody's pushing them. He goes, I don't know what it looks like, but everybody loves the nostalgia. They love mm. what it felt like in the moment. Sure. And especially in your most impressionable years when you're in your early 20s. When music, you feel it, you know, it means something, it's emotional. Yeah. It's awesome. Or know? it's like your sneakers, how they made you feel when you were 16 years old and you're walking in and the girl in class noticed you and like, oh, those are great sneakers. And you're like, ha, ah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got this. Yeah, right, my mom <laughs> bought me those. Yeah. <laughs> you know right? what I mean? Yeah. So... You got me a pair of sneakers today. Yes. Which was sick, by the way. Thank you yeah. so much. You're so welcome, man. What, let's let's explain these ones. So these are those, those are, are those are pretty simple ones. They are, but yeah. they match my watch. Yeah. Which is the it, most important that's thing. That's why that's what made us start our conversation in the first place. Sure. And so I wanted to get something that matched right. your presidential green face, which these I thought are was great. Sick. Yeah. These yeah, are sick. Essentially pine green 3.0s, they call them. Okay. Yeah. 
And it, listen, it's great. It's Jordan One. It's my favorite silhouette. I mean, I I, yeah. I love the shoe. I mean, yeah. I'm I'm super pumped about it. So good. Would you like me to be completely honest with you? Yeah. This will be my first pair of Jordan Ones. Oh man, that's different. so. This is we're gonna this like means, break the mold. This means You're a lot 35. to me. Thirty five. We really get you get into Jordan Ones. This means a lot. <laughs> Listen, I'm like I'm I'm always wearing you know Ferragamo. I've actually met you in a pair Ferragamo's, of Ferragamo's green you know? ones. Yeah. So yeah. I met you in a pair of Ferragamo, and I'm like, I'm such an asshole. I didn't wear any good shoes to meet you the first time. <laughs> no, they were great. <laughs> the always thing I, I notice about a man is I look at shoes and watch. Sure, tells a lot. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I know a guy that's worth over a billion dollars that wears an Apple Watch. So you really, I, which don't, I understand, don't know. That's technology. That's technology. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? That's different. You know, but we have your watch too. You know, I mean, your uh, yeah. You know, no. So I have a yeah. It's a forty-one millimeter Datejust bust down. Bust that's down. Yeah, and I got it from um, WatchMyDiamonds.com. Dimitri's cool. great. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I got I get a lot of my stuff from him. Where's he out of? New York. Okay. The Aminoff family, really okay. good. There's so many jewelers nowadays. Oh yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, it's getting crazy. I mean, what jewelry has become is kind of what sneakers have become, right? Yep. It's all about, you know, the look, the art of it. I mean, these are collectible. Everything's collectible. Everything. I mean, I, I, I was, I talked to somebody and they were like, wait, you're wearing those outside. Like, it was raining. Like, <laughs> you're wearing those outside. I'm like, all right, what am I going to do? I, I, I have them on my feet. I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to display them. I'm not I a can't collector. can't hold you hostage. <laughs> no, I love wearing the shoes, you know? Especially these, you can mess these up because these have a super cool the feature to them, right? stuff underneath it, yeah. Yeah, so this has this has a feature where you can scuff this and then the leather is a different color underneath. Yep. That's cool. I love those rip-away shoes. I have a couple of them. See, I'm not like an, uh, an artist. Yeah. I can't sit there and cut it away. I've seen them like uh, cut it and fray things, and it looks beautiful. And I try to do that, and it looks like a disaster. Yeah, but I mean, do you look at shoes like art? Like, do you think they're kind of looked at that way now? You know what? I, I used to really do that, and I used to really appreciate it. I think that it's gotten so big. You know, the company's gotten so big. I, I really need time to sit back and actually look at it and appreciate it again. Sure. Because I'll never forget when my uh, going over my brother's house when I was getting into it and seeing his whole room full of sneakers. Yeah, it had like such this like um, warm, like authentic feel to it. Now, when you know, just three days before Christmas, we sold over six thousand pairs of sneakers. I mean, that's essentially like six full U-Haul trucks full of sneakers. That's great. You guys, you guys broke a sale record that day as well. Yeah, almost seven hundred grand <laughs> one day. That's crazy. Seven hundred grand in a day. In a day. Yeah, from 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 a startup, and that's what you know. I want to tell these like young entrepreneurs is, you know, you really just have to go after it and become to like a point where you're actually obsessed with it. Sure. And if you're not obsessed with anything in this life, it's gonna fail. Of course. It's business or relationship. Or, you know, it's it's anything. And when we started this company, we had nothing. Yeah. We really had nothing. I'll never forget is um, we had $1,000 cash. And the girl I was dating at the time, I looked at her, and she always laughs about that. I said, this doesn't work out. Everybody's screwed. <laughs> <laughs> and literally, there was like a four-hour wait to get into the store. Damn. And, um, you know, we brought on an angel investor almost immediately. Okay. And we opened up seven stores, so I lived on the road. Yep. Sacrificed my whole personal life, everything. And then, um, is it, this is this is pretty cool. So December of uh, 2021, this gentleman walks in with his son. Buys like 15 grand worth of sneakers, letting his son do everything. He sits down, and he's got Rolex Masterpiece, all diamonds. I go, oh, it's a serious watch. Yeah, you know, it's a, like, you know, you, you look at that stuff and he goes, um, said, I love your watch. And we started chatting and having a conversation. And he finished and he handed me his card. He goes, I raise money for companies like yours. I just raised fifty million for Triller. Okay. If you're interested, let me know. Mm -hmm. I was like, Oh, geez. You know, so the gentleman that um you know, invested money in the beginning. He goes, listen, I'm retiring. I ran the company for the first year. I got you over the hump. Yep. Going to need some out, outside capital. So we called him up and uh, he ended up, put a deal together and we raised several million dollars through 2022 and we opened up another 10 stores. 
So that was crazy because it was, you know, you're on the road. The first year we lived in U-Hauls. Sure. We had no we had no money. Eat McDonald's, sleep in the back of a U-Haul. Second year was nice because you got to actually get to be in a hotel. You get to be in a hotel with a coffee bed. <laughs> a right? nice That's hotel, cool. you yeah, know? Yeah. And um, we went from everywhere from, you know, uh, from Denver and Michigan and Miami. And it was just, you know, it got better and better and better. You know, and now, um, you know, this year we're, we're doing another big raise. We're going to probably open up another seven or eight stores. And you're going international too, yeah? Yeah, so we've got a lot of requests to go to Singapore. Singapore, Singapore London. Shoe culture in Singapore is probably huge. Wild. Yeah. Yeah. London, I, I didn't know anything about London. I mean, it's... Yeah, everybody said it's great. I, I feel really stupid because I'm not cultured enough where I've traveled enough. Like, the United States? Sure. I think I've been everywhere, but... Three or four states. Okay. And I've really experienced it all. But as far as like really traveled, <clears throat> like, you know, France and London. Why and aren't Singapore, you in Dubai yet? I'd love to go to Dubai. Dude, I have an intro to a business. We're, oh, we're going to talk yeah. after this. We're going to, I'll, all right, we're going to, we'll, we'll discuss this on, off camera. Yeah. Because no. I'm, 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 I'm going to eventually open our clinic uh, branch and do some software stuff out there as well. Yeah. And Dubai's super cool. And they would love this shit. They would eat it up. You put this in Dubai Mall, you'll you'll be doing fifty k a day every day. Oh yeah, that's that, that, that's nuts. exciting. Well, you know what's crazy and it, it's good is the store you came in, you met me in yeah. Millennia. That's yeah. our, our number our number one store. What is up with Orlando and shopping, bro? This is the craziest shopping area. You know why I moved here is everybody's in a good mood because they're on vacation. That's so true. even if you're a local. Mm -hmm. You're gonna meet. You're gonna come across like 80 people in a day that are smiling with mouse ears on. That's true. You know, <laughs> because like you know, not knocking Miami. I mean, it's a great city. It's like everybody's trying to one up each other. It's all a show and go thing. You it's, know, it's, it's just like somebody buys a car, somebody buys a dealership. You know what I'm saying? Someone buys an apartment, someone buys a whole street. Yeah. You know, it's just kind of like that's not my vibe. Do you think it's kind of like Miami's like perpetual dick measuring competition? Yes. Yeah. It's it's, it's, it's kind of annoying. It's really. Um, the it's like the moral compass is broken there. I feel. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, and I think it's a great city. It's beautiful as a lot. It's becoming like the new financial capital of our well, country. Well, yeah. And there's a lot of there's not only the banking stuff down there, there's the crypto stuff down there. There's a lot of stuff down. There's a lot of money down there. Yeah, which is great. Yeah. But with the money comes the. Yeah, it's a little. It's a little bit of weird shadiness. You know, I just. You know the the what do we call it the the dick showing contest. Yeah. You know, yeah. The just, dick it's measuring. It's like it's not. Yeah, it doesn't interest like me either. I could care less, you know? No. When I see somebody that's doing great, dude, I'm like appreciative. I'm like, bro, it's a sick watch. Those are sick shoes. That's a sick car. Yeah. Congratulations. You're doing a you're doing a nine figure exit on your company. Fantastic. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. I'm applauding it. All it does for me is it makes me want to level up. Like I want to be there. Exactly. You know? It's not about a competition, it's about appreciation. Like, hey, maybe I can learn something from you. You know? I don't. I never got funding. I never got massive funding on my companies. I built it all basically organically it's and personally. So the conversation I'm going to have with you probably after this for dinner, yeah, is hey, let's talk about funding. I can that's, learn. That's something. an art. That's really an art. And, sure. You know, and a lot of people don't know understand. So a lot of young entrepreneurs, they will start a business and they say, "Hey, listen, I'm going to start a business where I'm going to create uh, an app." Yeah. Okay. And then what they do is they're they're going to get that, or they're going to start a retail front or a clothing brand or whatever. And so what do they do? They have their own seed money, mm -hmm. five, 10, 15, $20,000. And they go, I'm going to go to the bank and borrow money. And what is always the thesis? The bank wouldn't give me my money, so I couldn't grow my dream. Uh -huh. Well, you have to be nuts enough in your own brain and in person to have the work ethic for someone to discover you and say, I believe in you. Yep. I know what it was like to be a young entrepreneur. I'll put the money behind you. Let's see how far we can take it with X amount of dollars, 20, 50, 100 grand, and offer them equity. Somebody once told me, they said, you know, the biggest investors and the biggest investment bankers and, and private equity, they don't invest in a product, a service, or a company. They invest in the entrepreneur or the CEO. Correct. Because that's what drives the business. The wealthiest man I ever spent time with was, God rest his soul, he unexpectedly passed away a few years ago. His name was Michael Vlock. Pritzker family. Okay. He's worth $4 billion. And he invited me to have dinner in his home. And he says, I don't invest in ideas. Ideas have zero value. He goes, I invest in people. Yep. Because what a lot of people don't understand is 
doesn't matter. Success is kind of arbitrary. It could be like, hey, I'm making a thousand a week and that's successful for some people. Mm -hmm. But if you really want to get into the seven figure status, you have to be a little crazy. You have to be sure. kind of nuts. Sure. And very methodical and very disciplined. It, you know, and it doesn't mean that you have to get up. I, I love these self help books or theories or coaches where, okay, get up at 4 a.m. and then you drink your cup of coffee and then you eat a salad and then you do six miles of running and then you, it's like, you know, I can get up at eight o'clock in the morning, still get the same things done. <laughs> sure. Well, and it, it's all relative on what you're trying to do, right? right. Yeah. You know what I think you, you touched on a little bit ago when you were traveling all the time, you sacrificed your personal life, you're sleeping in U-Hauls before uh, for a year, before you even got to get, oh, sleep yeah. in a hotel. Yeah. What I see a lot of young entrepreneurs having a problem with is getting through the suffer point. You and I grew up in a different era. <laughs> Um, getting through the suffer point, everybody wants instant, instant gratification, instant everything. Yeah. And they're not really willing to truly suffer and go through the pain of getting to that point. What do you tell that person? Because these are plentiful. Well, you know, it, it, it's pretty cool. And he's one of my customers too. Dana White had a really good reel that said, you know, your birthdays, Saturdays, Sundays, going to the beach, balling out at the club. Yep. A really good dating life, you could throw it out the freaking window. It, it does not exist. I can't tell you how many holidays, birthdays, Saturdays, Sundays, missing things mm -hmm. that I went through to help build this company with everybody else. Sure. And then you also have to get everybody to buy in and get the participation so that they want to follow the same dream as you. Yeah. Because if you can't get people to participate on your team, you're not going to win. Well, you have to sell the vision. Correct. You're as as the entrepreneur, as a CEO, as a founder, especially selling the vision is so massive. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's it's uh, my brother who's back here behind the cameras. Mm -hmm. He just opened up a new entity over in Tampa Bay. Yeah. And you know he he bought this company. He's refreshing it, and it's like the amount he's sacrificing for it. You know, his family's here. He's got two little kids. Yeah. He's got a wife. But guess what? He's driving back and forth, back and forth, staying over there. We, we, we bought a rental property out there. So he's out there so much, but he understands as an entrepreneur the pain that has to go through it. But he's also in our era. You know, we're only 18 months apart. Yeah, so it's, it, it's, it's hard. And also the other hard thing, for especially for the young entrepreneurs, is there is an incubation time. Mm -hmm. So it's almost the same equivalent of saying, okay, I'm going to make this beautiful cake but I got to put it in the oven and it's got to bake for 45 minutes. You can't pull it out the oven at 37 minutes. It's going to taste like crap. Yep. And the problem is, is people will start to see a little bit of success. And let's say your first comp first year, your company's cash flow positive. You go, I'm going to take the money out and I'm going to buy a Lamborghini. So everybody thinks I'm cool. And oh. I'm going to go and buy a presidential and I'm going to get a beautiful apartment. And then you hit an economic downturn 18 months in and you say, Hey, you got to put a hundred grand or 200 grand in the business. And the people don't have it because mm -hmm. it's in a Lamborghini, it's in an apartment, it's in a Chanel bag for some girl you hung out with for two weeks. You know, it's like it's in it, people just blow their money. Yeah, on listen things. to that one, gentlemen. Stop buying Chanel bags for girls you know for two weeks. Yeah, Chanel bags are really expensive. <laughs> Do you know it's it's crazy? So I I bought one for the person I'm involved with. Okay, ninety two hundred. It's probably this big too. Yeah, it's <laughs> the caviar bag. <laughs> got it. Got it. <laughs> yeah. You know, but yeah, yeah, don't don't be going getting getting things for like somebody for two weeks or trying to the ball out concept. You look so stupid. You know, wait until either you have a lot of stability, and then when you have a lot of stability and you're really in love with that person, then buy them a bag. You sure. know, it's like that. That's that's what a lot of people do. They just try to look wealthy, and then it screws it up. I mean, like, I wear a nine dollar t shirt. Is that nine bucks? Fresh clean tees. <laughs> It looks good. <laughs> right. It nine looks more bucks. than nine bucks. Yeah. I mean, but like, yeah. But so, that's the funny thing. It's like you dress so much more simply. You, you can really tell the people that have a little bit of wealth, and you can tell the people that are really trying to show like they have wealth. Oh, I can't wear like these like Gucci pattern shirts looking like, you know what I'm saying? I, I can't talk shit right now because I'm actually wearing a Burberry. No, but you look great though. I'm wearing but a Burberry you look classy. Yeah. Thank you. But I like if it. I wore that stuff, I'd look like I was going on a date with the Temptations. I mean, you could look. I, I'm going to have you try this on. I might be a little big. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, you are bigger than me. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, the, the idea of faking it, yeah. you know, for the wealth and stuff like that, people do that so much. And I, I think there's <sighs> I there's a small amount of benefit to it sometimes, yeah. getting into certain circles, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Spending a little bit more, making yourself broke 
to try to show off is not the right way to do it. You know what I mean? So what's crazy is, let's say, for example, someone will say a level of success. You get to making a million dollars a year, which is an incredible living for anybody. You're, you're, at, you're, at, you're above the top 1%. So you're less than 1% of the population in the U.S. Yes. And so what will happen is, you know, let's say for, like, the gentleman that I know that raises money has not only a Rolls Royce, he has four. Sure. And he has several other cars. Color, color choices. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? He likes it. It's it's actually to the point where they don't even think about it. The dealer will call him and say, hey, this car came with some cool options. He goes, eh, just drop it off. Do you really think he cares about your Lamborghini Huracan? Yeah. Do you really think he cares? Do you really think if you showed up in an Uber? Do you know when I showed up to his house, for, uh, it's, we, we ended up going to get to have uh, dinner with, it was funny, President Trump. You know, it was it was great. And he's actually a nice guy. I don't get involved in politics. Yeah, we're not. We won't. We won't go no, too much into no, politics. No, no, no. I don't does get Trump in wear, politics. Does Trump wear Nikes or anything? Does no, he... no. But his son, his his uh, Donald Trump Jr. bought Jordans from us. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, I don't fangirl, but but anyways, I showed up to his house in an Uber. Yeah. You know, it's like I didn't have to show up in my Huracan. You no. know, because he's like, I don't know what car. He's like, all right, let's take the Phantom. He goes, I uh, might as well. But I'm just saying that it's like the people really don't care. They care about your passion. Sure. What your return for the shareholders is going to be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I think that in the grand scheme of things is trying to show off. You're not trying to, like, fool yourself. I don't think anybody really cares. You know, I, I think I think it's all internal when it comes to that show off game. You know? Huge. It's, it's all an internal thing. It's all a validation thing to yourself. Yeah, people don't uh, care as much as you think. It's like, did you ever see a thing where like um, you talk about like embarrassment, right? You ever like, do you ever like do something like really stupid and you're just like, oh my god, that was so embarrassing. I can't believe these people saw me do that. Oh yeah, they didn't even fucking notice. They didn't even notice you did that stupid thing. It's so in your head, <laughs> and you're so you you have it so wrapped up in your brain that this was such a detrimental thing that you just did that is so embarrassing. Nobody even saw it. Nobody yeah. even cared. I, well, th this this is a really good. So my mentor, who was is a great man, he's still alive, and I still visit him every couple months. Um, but when I was in my early twenties in the car business, working my ass off, I used to go get these like real expensive cars, like you know Corvettes or BMWs, whatever I could afford in my early twenties. And I was like, yeah, you know, I'm trying to impress this girl. And he goes, uh, you know what I used to do? He goes, I had a '64 Malibu. And he goes, and he used to hang off, and he goes, I used to have a can that I used to tie the, the muffler to, he goes, when I was growing up. And he goes, I would leave with a, gir with a girl, and the girl would say, what car is yours? And I would point to mine, and she would go, Ugh. He goes, you going to fuck me or the car? <laughs> and he goes, it's just like, you don't need the car. You bro he broke the ice with that. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I laughed, and I never understood. I looked at him like, oh, it's kind of weird. I mean, you know, when he would say that. Girl. But as I get older, I try to tell it to these kids. Yeah. You know, invest your money, save your money, invest in yourself, especially the kids that are talented. Invest in yourself. Huge. You know what I hate seeing all the time, and I see it way too often. These kids that are talented mm -hmm. that don't want to work at their talent, they just think that the talent, the oh. natural talent is going to be. It, that is, you know, wasted potential is, is the worst thing in this world. Worst thing on the planet. And, and I hate to say it is that society and, you know, TikTok and YouTube and a lot of these weird formats sometimes, they make it things like kids like, oh, hey, listen, I'm going to just be Mr. Beast. I'm going to show up and do a couple of quick videos, all set brand deal. You know what I'm saying? Coca-Cola is going to reach out to me. You know how rare that is? It's rarer than actually having a successful business. It's it, it is crazy. And so, for example, I don't know. I know you follow fitness. So the the big craze on YouTube for the fitness influencer community is Sam Sulek. Yeah, I've, I've seen him. I can't go in in nine months. I think it's nine months or ten months now. Three million subscribers, and his videos are an hour long. So I mean, he's got to be making three hundred thousand a month. I mean, I get I get like Chris Bumstead. I get that. C Bum's a great guy. Because C Bum's not only a great guy, yeah. he's handsome. He's got one of the most incredible physiques ever. Crazy. You know what I mean? So yeah. I'm like, I get it. I get why he is the most famous bodybuilding celebrity out there. Sam Sulik, who the fuck is that? And he literally <laughs> I'm not, I'm not and, dogging him. No, I just don't it, know who it, he is. And I have to say, like, I'll sometimes be like getting ready in the morning, I'll just be like, Watching his content, I'm like, wait a minute, he's doing the same arm workout he's done for the last three weeks. You know, but you just kind of get like entranced. Is he just like a person now? Like he's just very like. He's uh, in his early 20s. 
I, I've seen it. A lot you know, of drugs. He's an a lot of drugs. Looking guy. He, oh, yeah. A lot of drugs. Yeah, that's the other thing. And, you know, I think that, you know, these young kids got to, like, really slow down on a lot of that stuff. There's a way to do it as being a 30 plus year old man trying to stay young and, and defy aging. Sure. As opposed to a 20 year old. I mean, I can literally get any bodybuilder on the phone right now. Yeah. Anybody? Nobody does that at 20 years old. No. No, nobody goes that crazy. But. It kind of sends a bad message, but I see why people find it entertaining because he's like, he'll be eating Krispy Kreme donuts yeah, and like, you know, Five Guys cheeseburgers. And people go, you know what? I kind of resonate with this guy. And, and he's very know, soothing. His voice is very soothing. It's going to be sad, though, because the amount of drugs he's taking, the way he's eating and the way he's behaving, kid's going to die. I hate to be that bearer of bad news, but if he does not stop that after a while, he's going to hurt himself. He's going to have a problem. Well, you know, you look at somebody who I was a big fan of, like Dallas McCarver. Sad. You know, very, Super very sad. sad, you know. And, um, you know, recently I lost a very good friend, um, Boston Lloyd. He was only 29. I knew Boston. I was really good friends with Boston. Okay. Yeah. So Boston, and actually, and I, Boston and I had a lot of communication together. That's, no way. Yeah, man. So, yeah, I used to do a lot of Boston's financial planning, Got believe it. it or not. And Arielle and I are still really good friends. Okay. She actually invested in IK. So young, dude. Like, yeah. it's so sad. Even though it was more congenital, you wonder if it added to it. Sure. You know, um, you're but speculating, I, but who knows? You know, what a guy had a heart of gold. Yeah. Oh. But um, a lot of people do that, but it kind of like also backs into the insecurities. That these people and these influencers have now. I mean, like, let's look at like what the dating life is like nowadays. You've seen you've seen some of my content with the with the relationship <sighs> stuff. That's how I really popped off on social media was this relationship stuff. And people are like, you're not a relationship guy. You own medical clinics that do like HRT and like wellness and anti aging. I'm like, they're like, why do you like talking about it? I said, number one, it's interesting to me. I said, number two, I've fucked up in relationships enough to me feel too. like. I can actually talk about I it because I got it right this time. Yeah. I learned, I learned so many times. You know, I, there's a saying that I always say: uh, I never lose. I yep. either win or learn. Correct. That's that's how I think about everything. So you know, I never feel like a loser because I either learned a lesson or I won. So if I learned a lesson, cool. I'm gonna not make that mistake again. If you keep making the same mistake, you're just oblivious or an idiot, right? Yeah. But I had so much of this information in my head, and I'm like, man, I'm so interested. And I started looking into how culture and I'm, I have a sociology major in college. Yeah. So like, I like how, you know, uh, how society works. I like how people interact. I like communication a lot. And I mean, with this relationship stuff, it's a mess. Well, to let's kind of a like, young person right now is hard <laughs> to date. Oh, it's, it's, well, let's kind of like, let's back up 50 years, years ago when everybody goes, Oh, you know, I found true love with my grandparents. I want to be like them. Okay. Well, 50 years ago, you had a choice. You were only dating the men or women in a five block radius. Sure. Or that you shared math class with. Yeah. That's it. That's it. That was it. You had uh, the high school cheerleader that 19 guys were going after. Correct. So, uh, I mean, we can even expand on this. Like, oh, the dating world has flipped. It used to be like 20 guys going after one girl because that's how it was in the yeah. one city, right? Everybody went after the top one, yeah, and then it just trickled down. You didn't get the top one, okay. Next level down, next level. Exactly. Down, right? You didn't get the captain and cheerleading team. You got like yeah. seconds, third, fourth. Yeah, you got, you're going through four yeah. strings, fifth yeah. strings, right? So eventually, you had your wife, yeah. right? Now it almost seems like it's completely flipped. Now you have a plethora of single women that are only looking after very hyper successful men. It's almost completely flipped upside down. In the hyper successful men have kind of come up with a cadence and said, "Well, it's kind of like a uh, a buffet for me." Mm -hmm. You know, and well, because the women are also allowing themselves to be treated like that too. It's a problem. Correct. It's it's actually very interesting because you know my views on relationship have so dramatically changed over the years, and I would have to say probably it wasn't until I was like right around forty three where I'm like, oh, you know, I really just want it to be just one person. Sure. And I think that you know people actually do eventually meet the right one person. But I think it takes a lot of time. And I think that men and women, see, every five years as a person, mm -hmm. we all change. 100%. You know, sometimes people who was a little bit overweight is now into fitness. Mm -hmm. So if your significant other that you're married to likes eating McDonald's twice a day, and now you want to have ripped abs, it, that's not going to go well together. So well, you, you know, it's funny. Uh, so again, I've mentioned Patrick by David before. 
um, mentor of mine, but he was talking, he talks about marriage and relationships very, in a very odd way for most people. Yeah. I'm like, well, you know, you guys have been married, you and your wife have been married for this many years. They've been married for at least a decade, maybe more. Um, and I think 2003. So yeah, maybe a decade. And they have three kids together, four kids together. I said, like, well, uh, what's the, what's the probability of, uh, your relationship, uh, lasting forever? And he's asking the entire crowd. There's thousands of people in this room. Yeah. Like anybody, a hundred percent, a couple young people, hundred percent. Okay. You're oblivious, right? Yeah. Uh, 80, 70, 60. And then, and then he's like 50%. He raises his own hand. Everybody's like, and you're like, yeah, you're all looking at me like you're crazy. He said, but it really is that way. He said, what if my wife does this? Or what if I want to go this way and she doesn't? Or what if we dis... This is life. People's paths change all the time. Correct. You know, so the, the idea of refreshing your personality every five years, it's not just that. It's about being able to communicate with whoever you're with and constantly communicating, right? Constantly communicating and saying like, Hey, are we still on the same page? Hey, are we still on the same page? Keep dating, keep interacting, make sure that your um, trajectory's on the same page, and also qualifying them in the beginning, man. That's a yeah. huge one. And it's really hard because, you know, a woman who's 40 or older now, because, I mean, obviously, I typically like to date, like, 35 or older. And I, I've dated women who are younger. Yeah. And listen, you can't, like, we were laughing about this stuff out, like, you know, 80s pop culture. Yeah. You know, you, you run out of things to talk about. You know, and if even you go though to they're a twenty-five-year-old, you're not going to be in a happy place. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, they're, they're going to want to hang with me, like when I'm like fifty-five or sixty. No, I'm going to be old. Yeah, but anyways, um, where you know, women like that thirty-five plus, everybody has baggage. Sure, everybody. So you kind of sure. have to say, okay, what is an acceptable level of baggage? Most people have kids. Most mm -hmm. people have been divorced. Well, people have been through a nasty relationship with somebody that might be a complete jerk. And, but what is kind of coming down the line is imagine what some of these women in their 20s are going to be like when they're 40 years old. The amount of baggage, the amount of baggage that they're going to have to live through. I mean, listen, a woman that in their, was maybe married in their early 20s and did a little bit of clubbing or whatever like that. Yeah. It is nothing like this culture that's in, I'm not knocking Miami, but that's like in Miami. <laughs> the 304s? Yeah, 304s. 304s, 304s. You know, it, you know, where they're like, okay, one day they're on a boat party, you know, mm. in, in Brickell, and then the next day they're at, you know, um, at Live, at some dude's table, and it's just a big round robin. And what's going to happen is, they're going to be 35 years old and say, I really want to settle down, but they're going to have all this amount of massive baggage. It's just like, it's just trying too much. It's almost like dopamine overload. Sure. And I was very lucky enough where I've had so much dopamine overload where I met somebody that it makes my brain fire on all cylinders. Yeah. Very rare. That's great. But I mean, but let's look at the whole population of men and women yep. that are so overstimulated when they get to 40, it's like, what is it going to look like? I mean, we're going to end up like having sex dolls. That's what they're, everybody's nervous about. Yeah. Did you see, AI sex did you see the AI sex doll thing? What is it? Did you see the AI sex doll thing? No. Artificial. This is a real oh, thing. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah the I've, artificial I've intelligence uh, sex doll thing. It's, it's going to happen. Rogan was just talking about it. It's yeah, crazy. It's, it's going to happen. It's a, it's, a, it's a sick thing that's going on here. But why is that happening? So, and then you have both sides of the spectrum. Women are going to say, well, it's men's fault because they're XXX. Yeah. Men are going to say, well, it's women's fault because they're doing XXX. Who's at fault? Or is it just a societal thing? You know? Yeah. I don't know. Is it, is it, is it a societal thing that it's going that way? Is it a culture thing that it's going that way? Has it always been that way, but now it's more highlighted by social media? I don't know. I think that social media kind of takes you, it's almost like a tarot card reading. You know, you will actually warp your brain and your situation to accommodate that tarot card reading. And our brain will warp and manipulate itself based upon what's coming up in your feed. Mm. You know, if your feed, let's say you're kind of lukewarm on a relationship and your feed serves you five things that says you shouldn't be in a relationship. You're a badass man. You're a badass woman. Stand up for yourself. It's like, I don't need this person. You know, and let's say it's a person who genuinely cared and was right there for you. Sure. So you have to stay away from the mind fucks in this society. Yeah. Well, it's you, really hard. You have to stay grounded. You, you have to stay grounded. No, because everything is distracting. Everything huge. is a distraction. But people have a problem with the whole scrolling thing. People have a problem with overstimulating with information. This is a dopamine machine. 
Oh, I, listen. Everything I, I, you do. I hate it, but it's addicting. It's I a dopamine it. machine. Yeah. There's, uh, you know, people are like, well, you're on social media all day. They see my posts all day, right? Yeah. They see my, I'm like, that, I don't post. There's somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> I pay a team to do that. You know what I mean? You I don't, know, this, it's not me. Uh, you know, do I go and post my stories? Yeah, absolutely. Will I respond to some comments on set blocks of time? Yeah. But I tested myself one time and I was, I was intentional about not being on social media one day. Yeah. And I, I reset all the things. You know, your phone will tell you how much time you're spending on certain yeah, I'm apps. I'm three hours and one minute usually a day. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why that's what it just comes out to me. Yeah. So yeah. like I, I was intentional about doing it and I still spent several hours of, on social medias, one thing or another. And I'm like, I consider YouTube a social media too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though it's, I, I watch stuff on it, it's actually kind of yeah. informative or educational. Yeah. It's still something that I'm, you know, exposing myself to. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm spending four or five hours a day with some sort of social media that I consider social media interaction. That's crazy. And I was trying not to use it that much. So think about all these people that are just not even paying attention. Well, imagine we're, you know, people like, let's say you and I have a few dollars if we want to go out and do something sure. that's kind of like, you know, beneficial to our time, whether it be, you know, we can go to Disney. How about people who just don't have the money and they sit there and they get more and more depressed. My life is inferior. I'm inferior. And that's a horrible feeling. You don't want anybody to feel that way. Yeah. But, you know, like kind of like, you know, finishing off what we were saying is nowadays there's so much selection as there was 50 years ago. Yeah. I mean, even think about when we were hunter gatherers. It's like, if you wanted blueberries, you got them three weeks a year and they're going to grow from this bush. Right there. You know, they're going to grow <laughs> from this bush. If you sit here, the blueberries are going to come up. Now you can get blueberries 365 days a year. Yeah. And so we've been hardwired as a, as a society to say, you know what? She's not your type. This one's much better for you. Oh, she's not your type either. And just keep going and going and going. But what you end up happening is, your brain does get dopamine uh, resistance. Mm -hmm. You just really can't get excited about things anymore. So I think that's what we really have to watch and keep an eye on as a culture because we're, we're going down this where everybody's going to, their brains are going to be maxed out at 40, 50 years old. And then what's the next 20, 30 years going to look like? And they're doing that with everything. And that's why I think we're in a culture in a place where you have these young people Oh, I want to be hyper successful. I want to be Mr. Beast. I want to be an entrepreneur. Entrepreneur was never even a word when I was growing up. Was it for you? No one started their own businesses. I've never said no. You know what we would do? We would get a good job. Mm -hmm. We'd stay there and hopefully you moved up and you made a living. That's, that's it. Yeah. yeah. That and you got like a Honda yeah. and you got like a condo. Yeah. And you were super pumped about <laughs> yeah. that Honda, bro. Yeah. I mean, like my, my grandparents moved to this country, a little bit different situation, but they moved from Croatia. Moved here, started a bar and restaurant. Yeah. They were entrepreneurs. Yeah. But they weren't just they were just bar owners. They were just they were just they were old country immigrants that figured out how to open a business. Yeah. That's it. You know, but the term entrepreneur, everybody glorifies it. Well, and then I also it, think that a lot of people there's so much chicanery and black market things that people don't understand. Like there's so much fraud in the crypto industry. I mean, don't get me wrong, people legitimately make the money, but mm -hmm. there's all these Ponzi schemes that people will go out and they'll put a Lamborghini in their grandma's name and then they'll go and solicit money from everybody or they'll, you know, they come up with these right-winged ideas that are right-brained ideas where they're going to go get money from people and crowdsource it and bring in all this cash and they just spend it and they go to jail. And That's jail. the new yeah. scam. Yeah. What is really? that? Really? Crowdf they're crowdfunding and then just spending it? Oh, yeah. A lot of people saying, hey, you know, I got this fund. I'm going to make you so much money on it. That, that was really big with crypto Four or five years ago, when sure. it started to get popular, sure, yeah, everybody was like, doing, "Oh, they were they were making those coins." They were saying, "Oh, I'm going to do a coin." You're, I'm going to do a coin, yep. or I have these annuities with crypto because it was so easy to hide the money. And law enforcement goes, "We can't track this." Yeah, well, so they, people got away with it. A lot of those guys went to jail too. A lot of people <laughs> went to jail. It was like the PPP scam money. Everybody went to jail with that too. Listen, that was crazy. That was Miami all day. How many Lamborghinis were bought with PPP? Well, you know, it's funny because the first Ferrari I bought was in 2008 when the financial crisis happened. And, um, like, like stuff was so cheap back then. Yeah. You know? Oh, you can't even touch Ferraris for even remotely close to MSRP. Stupid. They're so crazy. Stupid. Yeah. And, I mean, yeah, every, like, 19-year-old YouTuber, like, uh, you know, sucking on ice cubes to drive a Lamborghini. It's the craziest yeah. thing I've ever yeah. seen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's there's so much money is a, is a weird thing now. It's going to go back. It's going to revert back. Well, you never you never heard of 18, 19, 20-year-old kids having 
hundreds of thousands of dollars. No. Unheard of. Yeah. yeah. Well, crypto's made that a uh, completely different thing. The internet's made it a different thing. Social media, marketing, uh, influencers. You can get a good-looking girl, Influencer dude. is such an interesting term. I got called it a couple times. I hate it. <laughs> You know, I called you an influencer. You did. I was, like, I was like, fuck you, bro. I was like, <laughs> I was like, I was like, yeah, I'm shooting with this uh, influencer today. It. <laughs> well, it's it's really funny because now at the business, everybody's like, well, we want you to use influencers to take the brand to the next level. Yeah, yeah. But if you really think of an influencer, it's like, how do you quantify what really people are purchasing or engaging with your product based upon? Tom Smith. Sure. Posting about this sneaker. Sure. You know, yeah, you have a discount code. Like, okay, it's just like, hey, it could be, you know, Tomo One. Use Tomo One. And you can just track it. Yeah. But how many people go in person? Or how many people forget Tomo One? Yeah. Or how many people have maybe got it from somebody else and the code was just put online to hey, use this code? So is it really authentic or what is it not? And I'll never forget somebody I knew that was a pretty big influencer, makes makes a living off it, and she said, with all these verified badges now, the the influencer, you know, oh. income took a big tank. Well, the verified when you started being able to buy verified, you know, you can check it, right? How, how do you do that? So you can check. You actually go on Instagram, so you can search it, and if you go on someone's post, I forgot how this works. So oh, really? You go on someone's page. Yeah. You know, I'm just gonna go on somebody random's page. So you go on someone's page that's not really verified, and you can kind of find it. So like, if you find a guy that has like ten thousand followers, right? Yeah you'll report the page. So go and report the page and then say it's pretending to be a celebrity. If you put that it's pretending to be a celebrity, type in a celebrity's name and they won't pop up if they bought it, but they oh. will pop up if it's an actual celebrity uh, check. Celebrity check. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, I I refuse to buy it. I refuse. I actually got one for real. I don't, no, it's, cool. it's good. Yeah, it no, cool. I got mine for real too. But it was, it was hard because, you know, you need like six news articles and thank God with... Well, they... Oh, yeah. I mean, if you don't have enough press, yeah. if you don't have enough, I mean, thankfully, with the podcasting, with the press that I got from the clinic and both personally, great. You know, yeah. it ended up working out. And the verified thing, the real one, is beneficial. Having a Google panel is beneficial yep. for business. But people people don't want it for what it's actually valued for. They want it just for clout. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's nothing like that. But I have to admit, like, I was pretty excited when I got mine. Well, I was excited. <laughs> but I was, yeah, I was, I was, I was real. excited when I got mine. I was yeah. excited it was real, you know? And I think that, you know, I know people, you know, I, I, I crack up now because you see people with, like, 800 followers have a verified check, and you're like, why? Why are you verified? But, you know, it, it kind of goes back to, you know, with the influencers. It's I think it's it's starting to hit, hurt, hit a certain point where brands are saying, what am I really getting out of this? I know it's really cool that... You know, somebody like huge, like Summer Rae, you know, wears my underwear. Sure. But is it really translate into sales? And actually, it's really, it's a funny example I use because I know a company where it does with Summer Rae, it really does translate. But, you know, is it better to use micro influences? Because like, you know, the person I'm involved with is she has a very small following, but they're diehard followers. Sure. And I know people have a million followers that they translate bad. You know, it doesn't convert. Well, yeah, and I mean, if you have a super mega celebrity that's doing this, you know, I don't think you're going to necessarily convert sales. I think you're just going to convert eyeballs. Correct. Which could convert sales. It's, it's, it's not as tangible, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the way that marketing has gone, but marketing has all gone organic. It's all gone organic. It's all gone social media. You, you want to know almost everything that we do for the company is paid social. Yeah. It, it's all paid social, and it's made it even more difficult because since Tim Cook changed the iPhone, where you cannot, there's no data sharing. Yep. I mean, you'll get like the weirdest, most random things. Like all of a sudden, like I'll get like a, uh, an ad for tennis rackets and puppies. And it's like, I think tennis rackets and puppies are great, but I don't want a puppy and I don't want a tennis racket. You didn't talk about or think about puppies or tennis racket? You know, yeah, I know. They're yeah. reading your brain, crazy? right? That's it's crazy. crazy. It's really crazy. And sometimes it does happen that way. It's crazy. I don't care what anybody <laughs> says. There's, there's, some, there's something up with it. Or you'll be talking about something in the grocery store and it'll... It'll, it'll trigger. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely listening to you. These oh. things listen to you all day. Oh, I believe it. And then I also heard something that it takes a picture of you like every every 30 minutes, like an invisible picture of you. Dude, That's a little uh, weird. Like, I don't know. I I'm just, getting a Motorola Razor. That's it. I'm going to go what, back. What was your first cell phone? Ooh, it was the Nokia. A little the ice, little ice cream sandwich. 
Oh yeah, you know what I'm talking about the Nokia. Oh yeah, and it had brick. It had uh, the, the the Snake game on it. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah the Snake game. So I had the uh, the Motorola. It was a Nextel, the i1000. It was like the clam. It was almost like the StarTac, but it had the chirp. The oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. So like, I remember the StarTac. I think we had a StarTac actually. Yeah, StarTac. Remember you can get a Mercedes and it had like a StarTac. Yeah, that's it. Sick. It, it, yeah, it was yeah. great. But that chirp thing would get you. You know, I'll never forget. Like I was on a date with some girl. And the walkie-talkie. So the girl was like, "Where the hell are you?" So the girl, the girl was really supposed to be dated. Like, Where the hell are you? Shit. I was like, "Oh shit!" Because like, you couldn't even silence it. So like, I think it like ended a lot of marriages. Yeah, I mean, somebody, I you know, it was probably a woman that designed that one. This, this might have been smart. It was. I mean, it was great design. <laughs> I thought it was so cool. You just pushed the thing. They're like, "Yeah, unlimited chirp." You're like, "Oh, this is great walkie-talkie." Because if you think about it. We were a generation that still used walkie-talkies. Yeah. Well, we had pagers, dude. We were talking oh. about... I was talking about this in... If you had a pager... Listen. Did you have a pager? I, I had a pager. It wasn't even hooked up. I would carry it around. I had a pager. That was bad. I had a pager. <laughs> you were going to pay for... Listen, you guys don't even understand. It was the coolest thing. And you want to know what? You would be like all important. You'd be like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, hold, hold on a minute. You got a phone? <laughs> you <laughs> got a phone, right? You got a Yay! phone. You got, you got a phone. You got a phone. Let me use your phone. You're like, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. Gotta we're go. really, we're really dating ourselves. You know, <sighs> we were alive when Jordan Ones came out, and we were, you know. <laughs> yeah. No, but listen, the, the pager was really high tech, or you know, um, or if you had uh, the original BlackBerry that really didn't do any, or Palm Pocket. The Palm Pilot. Oh, dude, I forgot about those. I'll never forget. I got one just to play solitaire to look cool. I was like, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Did nothing. Oh, yeah. Got brunch at two o'clock. <laughs> brunch you know? at two o'clock. Yeah, you know, like, oh, I'm going to put it in my palm. Fancy. Pilot. Super fancy. Yeah. But no, th things really have changed. And <clears throat> it's going to be kind of interesting the next couple of years with, I mean, crypto's here to stay. Sure. I think that YouTube is here to stay. And I think that the problem is a lot of people will be like, I'm starting my, U even people I know who are famous athletes. Yeah. They do a couple videos. They don't stick with it. And it doesn't get 100,000 views. And they go, I give up. Well, I mean, you know, and it's crazy to me. And again, it's, uh, are they younger? A lot of them? Uh, yeah, a lot of them are younger. So that's, it, why, why is it, Toma, please elaborate on this. Why is it these kids that are 20 or 21 work for three months and they go, you know, I'm not really making a difference uh, or an impression on anything. I think I'm going to give up. It's like, it's, it's the suffer point. I'm telling you, they can't, they can't fathom a, a world where they don't get that automatic success or automatic high or automatic anything because everything is so instant they're living in an instant world you get an instant text message you can instantly call anybody you can instantly get food delivered to your house you got uber eats right oh, yeah. you can instantly get a car at any points you got you have uber why you, do you think my business became successful they don't want to wait online they just come in and get it of course and they'll they'll pay more they don't care which is a crazy thing it's a crazy thing you know they'll pay more to come in get it right away instead of waiting on StockX or ebay or whatever yeah gotta it. have it now and got to get the picture for the clout. Oh, of course. You got to get the picture in front of the sign. Tell me how silly you thought it was when they put together Instagram stories. Well, this is stupid. This is like Snapchat. <sighs> it's the most popular. Th I can't live without stories. I'm, I find myself on stories a little bit here and there. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. I can't live without a story. I mean, the, I get the messages that I get from my stories are fucking great. I love it. It's so fun. Oh. You know, it's fun. I, I would love to see some of the comic relief you get once in a while. It's fun. Oh, the, just go look at the comments on some of these videos that came up. It's <laughs> hilarious. But yeah, man, that's the problem. These young people aren't willing to really put in the work and really fall on their face multiple times. They're, they're not willing to sleep in a U-Haul. They're not willing to not have a comfy place. They are living in comfort. Uh, one of my favorite quotes I just found actually this weekend, um, the cause of laziness is the pursuit of comfort. Yes. Well, I, you know, I think, and also people want to see immediate results because they think that's kind of how we've hardwired everything. Like with, you know, I'd say with the advent of Amazon where everything's here and now. Yeah. Everybody became hardwired the last 15 years. That if I want it, I can have it here and now. Um, you know, like, uh, you know, person I'm involved with, I think she's outrageously talented. And I tell her, hey, if you work on this for six months, it's going to monetize. And then you just hear the word six months. And you're kind of going, oh, geez, I got to put in this work. It's a long time, right? Yeah. And I mean, it's a fart in the cosmos. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's really a fart in the cosmos because you really can get almost like six months is nothing. No. If I had to say five years. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. Like people say like an apprenticeship for five years. Like, oh, geez, I never even dated anybody for five years. How am I going to do that? But six months, eight months, give it a shot. Spend the money. 
There's a there's a time. there's a theory out there. And I think it was from Jordan Peterson, a uh, psychologist from Canada. Love him. You, uh, you're you're Love familiar. Huge so, Jordan. You know Peterson he's coming to Orlando, right? We gotta go. I have VIP front row tickets. You need to get some. Oh, okay, yeah. Just um, let me, I'll, send, I'll me send you the link. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. Okay. I love Jordan. So Peterson. yeah, so it's gonna be a meet and greet too. Yeah. Apparently, so it's be sick. Yeah. Oh yeah. So uh, he said he's like, if you spent the time reading books and one subject, I know other people have said this too, but if you pick one subject you're wildly interested in, mm -hmm. and you spend, I want to say he said sixty minutes a day. It might have been even less. Sixty minutes a day reading books on that subject in less than five years, you will be among the top half percents in that field of study. Yeah. You'll be an expert. You will be literally one of the world's experts in X if you just spent the time reading an hour a day. What you know, but people don't even well in five years, five years is so long. That five years is going by anyway. You're telling me that you're not willing to put in an hour a day. You know, but now now you think of it again. So wait, if I put in an hour a day, it's gonna take me five years. My brain goes, if I put in two hours a day, it's gonna be two and a half years. Yeah, you'd be a machine. If I put in three hours a day, I could be a worldwide expert in the subject matter in a year if I wanna put the time and effort in. Cool. But I'm gonna have to prioritize that. That's the problem. They still it's they still want it immediately. Well, and even if you learn the skill, let's talk about the white elephant in the room, is you really need to know how to apply it. Of course. And then have the charisma and the speaking skills to get it over the goal line. Because another thing is how many times have you met young entrepreneurs that they're so smart, mm -hmm. but they can't have a conversation with any with the, with the, with the shoebox? I, listen, I consider most people much more intelligent than me. I'm, yeah, I'm, I feel like I'm pretty dumb. Dude, I'm an ape. <laughs> you looked at me? <laughs> this is ridiculous. You know what I mean? I'm yeah. like, how the hell did I build a multi-million dollar business? I don't know. I figure it out. <laughs> you, well, you, that, was the, that was the first thing I noticed. You had big charisma, big personality. And that's all, like always what I did is I just like I was always broke growing up. Mm -hmm. And I just said, hey, I'm going to be really likable. Yeah. And, and that's really what. And a lot of these young kids don't realize that. Or they think that. Hey, they're very smart, or they may have gotten lucky one or two times. Yeah, and then they're rude to people, you know. And then they're rude because they just come across because they don't have any personal skills. Arrogant, arrogant. Yeah. And that's another interesting thing with this society is they communicate like donkeys. Oh well, I mean, you know, they communication skills went out the window. Um, I think, uh, well, hundred percent, they went out the window during the pandemic. No one likes to talk on the phone anymore. Well, I've, when's the last time you picked up the phone? Uh, I, I talk on the phone a lot. A little bit, do you? Yeah, I talk okay, a lot. That's good. People. Okay, yeah. that's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah. But you're old school, okay? I have to keep it fresh because if I don't have conversation with people and, like, I appreciate the conversation we're having because it's very hard with some of my employees. Yeah. Because I don't, also don't understand the lingo. Like, oh, bat, cap, no cap. <sighs> Dude, I'm, I'm learning so much. I'm not mad at it. And I'm just kind of like, yo, what, what is this? Just, I can't. The cap is lie, right? No, li yeah, no lie. Cap is, is lie. No cap. No cap. Okay, no cap. Yeah. No cap is no lie. My favorite one is keeping it a hundred. Keep it, keep it a hundred. Or keep... finna. What is finna? Finna. Finna. Like you are going to. Oh, oh finna do something. Like I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm. Yeah, I don't know how to actually explain that. This finna. is a good segment. <laughs> 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 yeah, like finna. So, like for example, if I were represented by one of the biggest consumer uh, investment banks in the country, um, Piper Sandler. And if I ever got on a thing with them, it's like, yo, I'm going to keep a hundred with you guys. <laughs> you finna, I finna, finna make gonna keep this it thing no huge. Cap, <laughs> and let's keep it a hundred the whole time. And uh, we're going to, you know, all right, bat. They were like, you know, and they don't, you don't need to be articulate. Like, well, uh, Mr. Peace, Masterpiece Theater today, we're going to have a yeah, very articulate yeah. conversation. And, uh, you know, in the realm of this thesis, they don't care about that. But no, it's, you got to give it to people that it's very easy to understand. Sure. And, you know, a lot of people will be like, oh, well, you know, I want to be like, you know, for example, like, like say Jay-Z. I go, okay, well, Jay-Z was an incredibly talented rapper with some business acumen. He know, mm -hmm. knows how to speak. And now the guy's worth $2 billion. He can do whatever he wants. He can walk yeah. around with a silk smoking jacket on. He can do whatever he wants. But these young kids have to know how to at least have a conversation with investors and investment bankers. Yeah. It's, it's, about, it's about being able to... 
understand your audience, right? <sighs> Understanding your audience is huge. I learned that as a cop. Yeah. I learned 12 years of law enforcement. My audience changed every time I talk to somebody, you know? Yeah. Might be talking to a crackhead one second, might be talking to the drug dealer the next second, then might be talking to the owner of the entire apartment complex the next second. These are very different people, very different walks of life. What was law enforcement like? What, what, what's like your two cents on anybody going into law enforcement? Oh, God. Because I know it's a, it's a big thing right now because everybody looks at is safe, 10 and 2, 40 miles an hour, career benefits. But it, it's not as good as it used to be. And they don't let you do your job like they used to either. You know? That's what I heard. It's I, I would um yeah, you know, maybe this will piss off some of the law enforcement agencies out there. I don't really care. I don't work for you anymore. But I would never suggest anyone go into law enforcement in this political climate. The political climate with law enforcement right now is extremely negative and it makes police work much more dangerous because cops are afraid to do their job. I, I agree with that. I, I can't even imagine. I'm not going to elaborate too much on it, but I just with everything that we've gone through and sure. all of it is horrible. Yeah, you know, I just can't imagine being a new, uh, you know, patrolman mm -hmm. graduated and you go to your first call and someone's like, you're in a sketchy situation and something that caused you know mass hysteria in the world and you go, I don't know what to do. Oh yeah, you're morally torn. Am I going to get shot? Am I going to get killed? Do I defend myself? You know, I can only just imagine what's going through that person's head. You well, know? scariest thing, the scariest thing for me is seeing these young kids that are becoming cops uh, or going into first responder stuff and they're like, you know, being a cop, like you're in a dangerous situation. I was a shit magnet as a cop. Yeah, I literally got more shit than ninety nine percent of cops out Cause there. Because you're a good looking guy and you're tall and you're in, in good shape. I have no people, idea. People, people love to. Yeah, you people. draw, you drew in all the assholes. Yeah. So apparently, uh, you know, the, I just would gravitate towards just into ridiculous situations. But I was never afraid. I was told this from a very young age as a cop. I became a cop at twenty one years old. So first guy I ever talked to about law enforcement when I was actually in uniform. He's always said, better to be uh, judged by 10 than carried by six. And that yep. was ingrained in my brain. You're better, you're better off being judged by a jury than, being, than having six people carry your casket. So behave in that manner. Yeah. But now they're so afraid of media, social media, litigation, that you see some of these cops getting killed and they're like, why the hell? You see the video. You see the body cam. Body cams didn't exist when I was a cop. Yeah. But you see the body cam video. Why didn't he pull his gun? The bad guy had a gun. I would have shot him uh, eight seconds into the video. He'd have been dead. The guy has a gun on his hand. I mean, he's dead. You can't pull a gun on me. I'm going to kill you. That's yeah. how I operated as a cop, you know? But this cop is like trying to plead with this person. And then the cop ultimately ends up pulling his gun eventually. But the guy's already got a drop on him. He already shoots him. He kills him. It's crazy. It, it, it's, it's very, it's very scary. You know, but, you know, kind of getting back to what I did, you know, I got into selling cars at 18 and I really think that every entrepreneur should do six months in the car business. Do six months in sales. Yeah. Hard well, sales. Hard, well, hard sales. sales. Selling something very difficult. And listen, I'm going to tell everybody out there, real estate is not sales. Selling houses are not sales. You piss off a lot of real estate. Oh, right listen, <laughs> I will I will take the number one realtor and do a sales competition face to face with anybody in the whole country. I'll fly them to me or I'll fly to them. And the reason why I'm saying that is, is. The person loves the product. So what do you have to do? You're essentially a stylist. Think about it. This is what your budget is. You're going to get a Louis Vuitton. You're going to get a Dior. You're going to, you're going to get a, a Chanel bag, what your budget is. And you're going to go to your presentation. It's got a beautiful bathroom. It's got this. It's that. And you're also going to say, hey, maybe it's not your style, but you're still going to appeal to that person's emotions that this is what your budget is, this is great, this is the entry level, this is your pinnacle, this is your dream home, this is your forever house. Mm -hmm. There's only so many different things. And the people are kind of coming to you. Hey, you want a Tomo? I want you to sell me, a t what's your budget? 10 million, great. You're gonna start at nine, eight million, or you're gonna go to 11, five. Simple, it's common sense. Mm -hmm. A car salesman, you walk up to that person and they go, what are you doing? Just looking. Looking for what? <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? A car, light colors, dark colors, four doors, two doors. Mm -hmm. And you kind of break it down. And within, you know, 45 minutes, you have them signing away $30,000, $30, dollars committing them to five years. Sure. It's not like in a real estate transaction where people can go home and sit and pray and talk about it. It's it's very, very intense from front to back. Yeah. Now keep in mind it's much easier now because people, you know kind of say, okay, I'm going to research a Toyota. I'm going to look at a Toyota. You know, I was selling Nissans 
back when Nissan was almost bankrupt in the early 2000s mm-hmm. and everybody wanted a Honda or Toyota. Mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the thing. But anyways, I think that somebody should get into hard sales, these entrepreneurs. And like I said, and I think, listen, there's some great realtors out there, but I don't think it's hardcore sales. I think that somebody's in hardcore sales that gets into real estate ends up in the top one tenth of 1% of, of being a realtor because they know how to sell. And they're the ones that sell the 20, 30, $40 million houses. I want to do research on that. I want to see if that's the case. I bet you it is. Yeah. I bet you that I bet you some of these really high end realtors, I bet you they, I bet you they were doing some kind of other sales. I mean like these solar sales guys, oh, these guys, are, some of the solar sales are these literally guys, tenacious. These guys are tenacious. I had a guy pull up to my house on a Segway and he pulls up, zips right up there, yeah. and he's like, what's up, man? What's going on with your electric? I'm like, dude, you're killing it. You know, I, was, I was cleaning my truck. I'm like, first of all, you're killing it. I'm like, I appreciate this. <laughs> <laughs> you know who's the best salesman that I've ever seen? Is, you remember when the deregulation of energy was happening? Hey, let me see your light bill. I can save you money on your light oh, bill. Oh, yeah. They would chase you down. Oh, yeah, yeah. They'd chase me in the parking lot. Get away from me. Yeah, yeah. They were, they, they were going after it. But, I mean, that's, that's what it takes. Yeah. Sale, people don't understand that sales makes money. You can make it. Fucking lot of money being good at sales. Andy Elliott, are you familiar? No. Oh, Andy Elliott's, uh, he was a car sales uh, trainer. I met him um, at an event and he has blown up. I'm talking about he he went from, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe making six, 10 million in his company doing yeah. sales training for car yeah. dealerships. Now he's doing sales trainings for everybody and he went ballistic on social media. Really put his personality out there. Yeah, he's about to hit like 1.5 million followers. He's doing over a hundred and some odd million this year. That's that's incredible. But that's who the people should go see. Yes, you know, and like, listen, I, uh, I just think that hard sales are, are something, and it's a great tool in the toolbox. Do you think that you guys are really selling, or do you guys think that you guys are really kind of just getting people in there, and it's just kind of an easier thing for the sneakers? Yeah. So. One of the reasons our success and one of the things that's made us different is it's a full presentation in a sales process. Yeah. So if you notice, come in, sit down, try the shoe on. Yeah. Pair it up. Yeah. Because I always essentially call it's called the puppy dog clothes. So, you know, you ever go to a pet store? You know why there's all those puppy pens? Oh, yeah. Because the second that the people put the puppy in the kid's hands. Oh, it's done. They're going to say, Mom, Dad, I hate you for not getting me this puppy. Yeah, I'm, gonna do, yeah, I'm not yeah. going to do anything. And you want to know what they're going to – and people will – you know, parents will negotiate. All right, you're going to get all A's and clean your room? Yes. P- put the puppy in the bag yeah. or whatever. You know, yeah. we're taking the, <laughs> the puppy, puppy, in, the the puppy bag. in the bag. We're taking the puppy home. <laughs> you know, and, and, and that's why there's all those puppy pens. Yeah. So we, I do the same thing. It's like you try on the shoe. A lot of these resale stores, yeah. they wrap the shoes up in plastic. I hate that. I hate that. And I'm, I'm literally, everybody goes, why don't you do that? People's grubby fingers touch that. I go, okay, well, let me get this straight. So it's a $500 to $800 pair of sneakers. Totally understand your argument. Mm-hmm. But you mean to tell me that someone can go into Dior or Louis Vuitton and touch a $10,000 bag, Yeah. but then they what? can sell it to somebody else? What's the difference? Just compare their shoe. Their shoes are all 1000 bucks plus. They, they don't have them wrapped up. So it kind of became this like this weird culture. Hmm. That basically people were like, oh, you're not too, you're too not cool enough to have this unless you just want to buy it. So then, but then you got to let the people try it on. I mean, mm-hmm. the biggest thing with StockX Go, you know, the eBay, a lot of these, once you buy it, you really can't exchange it because mm. it's a marketplace. So do you know how many people come in and sell shoes to us that have bought something for their boyfriend or their girlfriend or their dad or their mom and it doesn't fit because they don't know any of the sizing? So the people appreciate our concept so much because they go, they get to try it on, but then they get sold everything else. Yeah. Well, you sure. Got, you got the clothing. You got, of course. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, we have PSD underwear. We have, uh, you know, rejuvenator, obviously sneaker care products. Sure. So it's like you kind of get involved in the whole process and then you also become comfortable. It's like having a realtor or a car person you like to deal with or, you know, a guy that's going to teach you about fitness and lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. It's they get really comfortable with that, and now you're their go-to. Yeah. And it's grassroots. How many How many stores do you have now? 19. 19, okay. From as far west as Hawaii. Okay. As far east as Connecticut. And we talked about going a little bit international, and then you have some something real cool happening, too. Yeah, so high, high seas. <laughs> Okay. So, so we just uh, we just made a deal with LVMH. Um, we so LVMH owns 
all of the rights to all of the cruise ships for retail. Okay. So if you go buy anything from a Snickers bar all the way, th- you know, up to a Louis Vuitton bag, they all own the LBMH. retail rights. Really? Yeah, because it's very difficult to, they contract people from all over the world. Sure. They go live on the boat and they sell stuff. How cool of a job is that? Yeah. Just Great for a young person. Cruise. Great yeah. for a young person. So they do all their, their room, board, food, et cetera. And, um, so it's actually very sophisticated, and the vetting process was, we started this in June, and we just got the green light yesterday. Which is really This cool. just happened yesterday? Yesterday, yeah, but it was seven months. It was like, it, it, was, it, it was a lot of meetings. Congratulations. People coming and visiting, and they wanted to understand the concept, but yeah, we're, we're going to be opening up on three of Carnival Cruises ships within the next month. Wow. And then, um, you know, we're hoping to be between like 18 and 25 ships within the next year. Wow. So, well, you know, Impossible Kicks will be the only sneaker resale concept on the high seas. That's sick, dude. Yeah, I know. So it's so sick. cool. It's so cool. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, what you've done in such a short span of time. You know, I don't want anybody to watch us and be like, oh, you did it so quick and I can do all this stuff quick. You did it quick. Right place, right time. I love timing. Timing is huge. It is right place, right time. Timing is huge, but right work ethic. The right amount of work, the right amount of connections, the willingness and ability to take on investors. I see a lot of entrepreneurs get real greedy. They well, don't want to give out equity. Yeah, that that's another thing. And in, in the entrepreneurs, the propensity to play well with others. Sure. That, that was a very difficult thing. Um because you have to really say, when you're going to take outside money, mm-hmm. you have to say, okay, these people have skin in the game, so at least I'm going to listen and be receptive. Yeah. You know, a lot of people think like, oh, well, you know, Steve Jobs used to put his feet up in a boardroom, tell everybody to go fuck themselves. That was Steve Jobs. Yeah. The company's worth a, a T. Yeah. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, the valuation starts with a T, so yeah, relax. Yeah, valuation starts with a T. So, I mean, like, you kind of say, okay, I'll deal with a little grief. Sure. But if you're a young kid or a new aspiring entrepreneur, you're going to deal with that and not mm-hmm. be as emotional. That's one thing I can say is for all new business owners, like new CEOs, it's like, yeah. listen, these people will guide you in the right direction if you get the right team. And um, take everything with a grain of salt. Don't take it personal. My f- my first year as CEO, I used to take everything personal. And mm-hmm. oh, I-, I guarantee if anybody on our board would listen to this, like watch this, they'd be like, "Oh yeah, I, re- I lived it with John." I remember that. Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> you know you really have to be intense and stand by your your morals and values internally. But you also have to say, "Hey, it's not all mine." Sure. You know, yeah. so I have to really take everybody's outside view because what your vision for the business. You might have to say, okay, I can be 90% mine, 10% someone else's. But it might be a great idea. You know what I mean? And it, it sometimes is. Nine out of 10 times, it's a great idea. Yeah. Because yeah. you're not aligning yourself with idiots. You're aligning yourself with some of the best and the brightest. That's what that's what matters. And that's another thing is a lot of these CEOs want to, you know, a young CEO want to pound on their chest and say, I'm CEO, but you need a great CFO. My company would not be what it is. Mm -hmm. Impossible Kicks would not be what it is without our CFO. Um, I have the best CFO because he tempers me down. You know, I'm water and he's vinegar. You know, it's like, or oil and vinegar. You know, we're like literally completely opposites of each other, but we make it work. You balance it out. He balances you out, you balance him out, I'm sure. We actually have a really good relationship now. I said, I wish we had our blow-ups on film (laughs) because they'd be worth... A hundred grand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You know, because they were really epic. And he's really quiet and reserved. And I would just yell. He goes, all right, I'm hanging up now. Fuck you. <laughs> Listen, that's that's the kind of relationship you want with somebody. Yeah. That's a great thing about yeah. being in that kind of business environment, right? Yeah. You get to, you can be told, hey, fuck you. The next day you're going to talk and you'll be fine. Yeah, you know, it's it, it's really crazy. But those, those are the times. And listen, um, for business owners, especially this time, it's like, Bad days are going to come. Yeah. It's not all green pastures. And, you know, a uh, guy in business for a long time told me nothing good or bad lasts forever. And that's true, mm-hmm. especially in business. There's going to be happy times where there's money coming in and everybody's buying new houses and cars and kissing each other and everything's wonderful. But you have to say there's going to be some bad times. Peaks, where, and, peaks and valleys everywhere. Where we have to dig and you can't fly first class. And, you know, I mean, uh, you know, 2023 was... Uh, not nearly as robust as 2022. So sure. you got to make some sacrifices where, you know, 2022, I was flying first class everywhere. Yeah. 
2023, my CFO goes, listen, you're still going to, you're going to fly in Comfort Plus. And I'll never forget, you don't know who I am and what I did. <laughs> and I'll never forget, I almost feel like bad, like talking to him. But like, I was just so silly because I remember like two years before I was sleeping in a U-Haul. Yeah. You know, so. Uh, when you put it in that perspective, when you measure backwards like that, how cool is it? You know what I mean? When you're like, fuck, I couldn't even, I was, I was driving a U-Haul. I couldn't even get on an airplane. Well, think about like what you did. I mean, I'm sure that this started with an iPhone. Oh, now you have a whole studio and a yeah. team. Well, it did actually. I started with an iPhone on a treadmill. My Tomo, <sighs> this concept of Tomo Talks, my podcast. Yeah. I literally was doing treadmill talks, doing cardio while I was still bodybuilding and a cop. Yeah. And I'm doing these every morning and they started to get to like 5, 10, 15, 20,000 views on Facebook Live. Crazy. Yeah. What do you think about bodybuilding? No, I'm just, I wasn't even talking about that. I was just bullshitting. Yeah. Literally just bullshitting. Yeah. Talking about whatever was on my mind. And then someone commented one time, like, I'm really loving these Tomo Talks. I'm like, it's a good name. <laughs> no, but like kind of getting back at it, like, what do you, what do you think about bodybuilding as a sport? Like, how do you, because I, I, lo I love the industry and I love, I me, love you know, I, I have like, like pros and cons, you know what I'm saying? I love bodybuilding. Yeah. I hate what I see it doing to very, very young kids with the amount of uh, underground anabolic steroids, SARMs and all that stuff involved. Mm -hmm. It's really fucking kids up. Like it really, it's it's really causing a lot of problems. Yeah, and it's like I can't blame the bodybuilding industry, but I almost wish they would address it a little bit. Yeah, you know, and just be like, hey, listen, this is not the path unless you are going to be a competitor. If you're going to be a competitor, everybody knows that you need to do this stuff. Yeah, you know, it's um, I've been very fortunate enough. I've always looked up to them because I know the dedication it takes. Insane. I was and a competitor it, for 15 years. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's... And, it, and, it, and it's a great sport, and I think it's disgusting how they're way underpaid. Oh, God. You know, I, I know, you know, like, let's say at Mr. Olympia, yeah, you're going to make seven figures, mm -hmm. but you're going to make it for a couple years. But, uh, you know, uh, an average athlete in the NFL is going to make that in one year. Oh, yeah. Their whole career. Oh, yeah. But I think that these PEDs, I think that these young kids get involved with them. It's my only knock on it. The rest yeah. is beautiful. The and rest you know, is wonderful. And, and you know what's crazy is all the, the, the high level top 10 in the world in every yeah. class, they don't even talk about drugs. No. Or PED. They don't even talk about it. But I do know what they take and the doses are fractional compared to what some of these kids are taking. I know what they're taking because a lot of them come to my clinic. A lot of them are getting checked through my clinic. A lot of them are doing their off-season TRT through my clinic. Yeah. I have, I mean, a, a couple of them wouldn't mind me naming them. You know, I have like, I've had Brian Ansley come through. I've had... Brian's a great guy. I've had Phil Heath come through, you know, during, Phil's a great during, guy. Uh, during the pandemic he came through, we helped him out. Uh, Logan Franklin, I mean, you know, like... I've had these, I, Seth Ferrosi, you know, I, I've had all these guys. All that, great people. Uh, all these guys in the industry. I know all of them. I've known them for years. I've been involved in the industry. But you was, know, you know what, that they don't take what, like, no. I'm just saying like, for not example, even a chance. somebody, I'm not saying Sam Sulek, but somebody that looks like him at that age sure. is taking. No. I mean, it's like three to five times the dosage. Yeah. You know, and then, you know, you got to remember Phil Heath went pro completely natural. And I mean, complete freak of nature. That's what a lot of people don't realize is, you know, I can sit here and push as much stuff as possible. I will never be a pro bodybuilder because I don't no. have the genetics. For Same. It. I was told that in my in my last competition I ever did. And you have crazy genetics. I told I was told by Steve Weinberger, if he watches this, yeah. I'm going to try to send it to him. He'll, <laughs> he'll watch it. He told me my last competition. He said, Tomo, he's like, great physique. He's like, you miss your pro card this much. I missed it. I got my ass picked in the open. Yeah. I won my uh, class was only one pro card of that show. Yeah. So, and he's like, you're going to get your pro card. He's like, you might get it as a master's um, when I go, when I went over 35, yeah. I think I was 32 at the time or something or 31. And he's like, but you're going to get it. He's like, and then you're never going to win another show again. Yeah. It's, it's, and I was pissed when he said that, but <sighs> then maybe five minutes later, I was steaming a little bit. Yeah. And then I'm like, holy shit, he's right. It, it, it's like, so... And right there, I decided, right then, I was in the Caribbean. I was at Caribbean Grand Prix. I have to be Caribbean Grand Prix for my pro card. Yeah. And I decided right there and then, I'm like, that's the last competition I'm ever going to do. Not because I failed, not because of anything, just because I've come as far as I needed to go. I looked fantastic at this show. I've hit my pinnacle. And the only thing that I'm going to do after this is damage myself. Yeah. Super solid to accept that. 
You know, and I think that people say like, you know, like let's say like uh, you know somebody at the pro level is doing like four or six IU's a GH, sure. you know, and then they're like, okay, I'm going to really step up to the next level. I'm going to do 20, 25 IU's, and then they just like have all these health implications, but they don't realize that people are hyper responders with freak genetics, and they just they just grow a certain way. But it is true, like what, what you were saying is people will win their pro card, and then like for example in men's open, like you're you're you have no shot of even getting an Olympia qualification. No. Not even shot because I mean the athletes there are all young and they're in incredible shape and uh, it's just you're never going to get there. Same thing with like let's say um men's um men's physique like Aaron yeah. Banks, really close close friend of mine. Sure. Genetic freak, hyper responder. Yeah. And everybody goes, "Oh, you know, I mean he did it in 3 years, which was unheard of." Yeah. Now these, you know, uh physique guys, they go in there and they just that's it. You'll never, never be show. you'll never beat your genetics. Something that I always harp on people, if you have the genetics to look like a Phil Heath, listen, nobody's going to ever look like Phil Heath again probably, but if you ever have the genetics to even look remotely close yeah. to Phil Heath, you're going to get there almost naturally, and the rest is just a little bit added, right? You're just going to puff it up a little bit, right? Yeah. Ronnie Coleman, freak, oh, competed crazy. at the Olympia Natural. Correct. Insane. Correct. So, you know, the, these are people, these are kids that do not have the genetics to do these things. And they think that because they read something on the internet from some other idiot who's writing something, oh, if I take these massive amount of drugs, I'm going to look like this professional bodybuilder. I'm like, th there's a 99% chance it's not going to happen. Well, it also kind of gets back to, you know, body dysmorphia and even like, let's like, let's bring women into it because with these, these influencers, with this Photoshop, it, it's funny, um, uh, John Dorsey or Goob, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's got about 600,000 followers now. He exposes women, uh, you know, fitness coaches that are sucking in their waist and altering pictures. Sure, sure. Because it ruins people's brains, you know. And I, I, I really laugh because you know, the person I'm involved with, you know, she's in incredible shape. She's a size zero. Yeah. She's 110 pounds, and she's just like, oh, you know, I got this and that, and I like the way this girl looks. I'm like, yeah, you look amazing. Stop. You know, and and it, it's just the people really get into these. You know, mindsets of saying I can be better, I can be better, but they don't realize it's perfect lighting. It's one tenth of one second. It's full. You know how many shot. pictures it took for them to get that exact picture? Yeah, six thousand of them. They're like there's a million of they're them. They're depleted the phone. and carved up. Yeah, and you know, it's like it, it's crazy because people don't look like that year round. No. It is impossible to look like that year round. Yeah. So you just really have to love yourself and say, Hey, listen, I'm going to lead a healthy lifestyle. I'm going to have a flat stomach. You know, if I'm a girl, I, my waist can be smaller. I'm not going to, you know, look sloppy, man or woman. Sure, sure. That's really what you got to go for. Take care of your body. Just take Correct. care of your body. You People know? go on these like crazy binge diets. If there's a new diet every month for something different. Oh, don't get me started. Don't get me started on the diet stuff. It's crazy. You know who I, I think I, I love watching his content is like Jay Waller. But oh, yeah. I mean, what is he? He's got to be 6'3". Yep. Probably 240. And he goes, I eat one, one meal a day. Impossible. Calorie is a calorie, okay? His maintenance calorie's got to be 3,300. At least. How are you going to eat 3,300 calories in one, one meal? He's got, I mean, I've done it. Yeah, but I mean, that's a lot of food. <laughs> that's a lot of food. You know, that's a, I mean, but like, but, but to do it to an effect, like, if you're going to eat like, you know, like chicken carbonara and like bread, yeah, but yeah. I mean, he looks fantastic. Yeah. You're not going to do that. So it's just like, everybody just say, okay, well, I have a protein bar and I have yeah. an omelet that I'm not yeah. going to talk about. Everyone's like, well, I'm on this intermittent fasting and then I do a colon cleanse. And people are like, like eat three or four like reasonably healthy meals. Like I mean, I eat McDonald's three days a week. Do you really? Yeah. Yeah. You, I, you look good, bro. Three, you look thank good you. for this. It's three cheeseburgers. You know, everybody like everybody out there like I don't suggest anybody doing this. I'm I'm super anti fast food. <laughs> <laughs> so three cheeseburgers, okay, nine hundred calories. Yep. Forty five grams of protein. Yep. You know what I'm saying? And uh like hundred twenty grams of carbs. I mean, you've got ninety grams of fat. That's your whole fat for pretty much for the whole day. But sure. I'm just saying that it's not nearly as bad because how tall are you? Six two? Six three. Six three. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you're what, two forty, two fifty? You think. What, what are you? I'm only like two twenty. Really? Yeah, I have really yeah. thin bone structure. So your maintenance is like thirty one, thirty two hundred. Something like that. Yeah. So like you figure like it's sometimes hard to eat those kind of calories. Yeah. Yeah. So like lot. I'll be running a little bit of a deficit and I'm like, okay, I'll eat that. But I know one's like kind of starting to put on the fat because what I've noticed is I'm sure you probably have a six pack. I don't think that anybody, male or female, goes, 
wow, he or she is that much more attractive with the six pack as opposed to a flat stomach. Yeah, I if think- If you have a six pack, you'd be kind of like I think if you have a six pack, I think if you have a six pack, you really understand your nutrition. You really are working on yeah. it. I stopped caring about even having a six pack. I have a, I have a flat stomach. I probably have a four pack. You know, let's say that. Some of them about, yeah. So, you know, I probably have that, but I stopped really caring about that extreme level of aesthetics and leanness after the competition stuff because it was just, it wasn't needed. I look good in clothes, and I mean, listen. And you're tired all the time. This is the first time yeah. in my life that I was able to go buy an off-the-rack jacket for a suit, like this year. Yeah. Because I was always so big. Huge. I had to get my all my shit tailored. And now all my tailored stuff looks kind of big on me, so I have to get that tailored again. Yeah. But I went in, and I'm like, you know, I went and bought an Armani jacket, and it fits me great. I mean, I can button it. I'm like, this is fucking great. I don't want to get any bigger than this, you know? What a cool feel. People that aren't into bodybuilding wouldn't understand this. Correct. Or you want to know, and it's, it, it's like anything like I, uh, being bigger, you always want to be bigger. And yeah. the same thing with women. Women always want bigger legs or a bigger bot or bigger boobs or, or smaller waist. Or or smaller small, waist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like people have like a rib removed to like, you know, to that's look. fucking wild. I, I mean, like I've, I've heard, I've heard it all. It's just the biggest thing is go for a healthy lifestyle. And if yeah. you have a flat stomach and I think that, you know, if you feel good about yourself, that's it. It doesn't need to be more and more and more exaggerated. I think what's so crazy is Kim Kardashian or the Kardashian girls in general spawned this big, you know, um, hysteria for BBLs. Yes. And so everybody went out and got, you know, a BBL. Now think about Kim K. Doesn't matter. Hey, surgery is going to cost 600 grand to be perfect. Yeah. Yeah, spend it. Who cares? These girls are going to spend like 5,800 in an alley in Miami somewhere. You know, it's like, it's just. They're coming out disastrous, too. Have you seen them? Have you seen them? Oh, it looks like a sack of potatoes. It's bad, bro. Yeah. And (laughs) I don't know what girl, you know, is going to look back and go, wow, I'm happy with that. (laughs) Got exactly what I wanted. You know, it's it's kind of like, you know, you ever like see like fast food or something on the menu and you get it and you're like, it's not what I ordered, but it's in your ass. It's in your body. Oh. Yeah. And then you're just going to tell everybody, I love it. I love it. Should yeah, have gone no. bigger. It's like, you know, it's like they kind of like delude themselves into like thinking it's like, like, it's like when somebody gets a tattoo and it comes out fucked up. You're like, no, no, no I wanted it like that. Yeah. I've got a, had a couple of those. <laughs> you have a couple yeah, of those? Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. This one, right? Like the, this arm came out great. I wasn't trying to call you out. Yeah, it's, yeah. I, your tattoos look great. You're fine. They look fine. Uh, I wasn't trying to be there. Yeah. No, no. But it, 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 it is kind of true. You kind of like talk yourself into it. Well, you don't have a choice. You just did all that. You paid all this money. You saved money for it. It's in your body now to get it surgically removed is a giant problem. You know, but what is that whole thing that we just talked about? What is that whole thing about? It's comparison. Comparison being the thief of joy. You can't be happy with shit. Well, and usually it happens a lot of times where I see a lot of, I see it more in women because men really, I don't see them. They kind of like, obviously they augment through muscles. Sure. But it's typically people who are as, you know, fortunate and they kind of said, Hey, I can't have a Ferrari and I, you know, I I don't have this. So I'm going to really augment my body to hope I can go land somebody so I can live happily ever after. And it's, and it's sad. Some women just do it for themselves. Sure. But, um, you get really stuck and I know women that have gone extreme and then I've said, you know what? I was really happy with my body in the first place. It's the same thing with lips. How many women do you see are dissolving their (sighs) lips or, the lip I think thing that some women crazy. have a good eye for it, and they do just enough where it looks really good. And some women, you look at them like, Ugh. oh yeah, yeah, Ugh. yeah. It's kind of like the '90s. Remember when women used to pluck their eyebrows really thin? <sighs> do you remember that? It was, like, it was a, a little, line. Yeah, a little tiny. line. And now they can't get them back. No, they're doing now they're hair getting replacements. Hair replacement yeah. implants in their eyebrows. Yeah, it's wild. It is wild. I mean, listen. I think there's nothing wrong with anti aging. I mean, I've been getting like filler and Botox for four years now since mm-hmm. I turned 40. Sure. Yeah, you know, and I think that, um, I think it's it's always good to keep up. But I mean, I think that's some of the mystique with, you're never going to look like you were when you were 25. No. And you shouldn't expect to. And you shouldn't want to. No. I think it's weird. It you is know? weird. But you want to just keep that youthful appearance. Like, you know, your face starts to sag. And, you know, um, it's like even with bodybuilding, you know, you gain weight, lose weight, your face loses that that volume. So it's mm-hmm. kind of good to give you that freshened up look, I should say. Yeah. No, yeah. it's it's always good to take care of yourself and and looking at yourself in the mirror and being happy will make you more productive. 
it will make you a better person all in general. You know, you have to be happy with your appearance. If you don't like the way you look, if you wake up in the mirror, you look every day in the mirror and you're like, oh, I hate this, this, that. Dude, get a haircut, shave yourself, groom yourself, lose some weight. If you need a couple units of Botox, get it. If, if you have, you know, if you have some kind of problem on your face, you're like, hey, I really have a problem with this. You know, people have like, uh, uh, they get the nose job where it's like they have the hump. Oh, and yeah. they get it like shaved down. Yeah, it's actually a relatively inexpensive surgery. It's not yeah. that much, but like that is a drastic thing that someone can do. But then they can look in the mirror like, oh my god, I'm beautiful. Where well, they would say that wasn't beautiful before. Well, you know, another thing it's uh, you know it kind of ties into this is when you know you really take care of yourself. I mean, we're not talking that you have to be a seventh or a ten to be successful. Sure, but if you take care of yourself and you care about your appearance. When you meet with an investor that's going to invest money, like this person takes care of themselves, they're going to take care of my money. Absolutely. And that's a huge thing for men and for women. Well, listen, my biggest pet peeve on people is obesity. I have a, I ha, I'm not saying, like, listen, the, the, there are people genetically predisposed. I, I do agree to a certain extent. The genetic predisposition is a thing, you can fight it. Mm -hmm. And most of the people that will argue this will say, well, hormone issue, glandular issue, um, you know, X, Y, Z, all correctable, by the way. Mm -hmm. You know, so all these things are correctable. Uh, thyroid issue, they, I always hear those things. But when you see them, it's not just that they're overweight and they're trying. It's like most of them, when you see an obese person, it's usually pretty blatant gluttony. And yeah, I find you know. it lazy. I find it lazy. If you're lazy with your body, you're going to be lazy with work. You're going to be lazy. It's it translate. How you do one thing is how you do everything, right? Yeah, you know, what, I, what I've what i noticed is uh, one of my best friends, you know, my 20s and 30s, unfortunately, passed away. But he uh, um, was very obese mm. where he got the gastric bypass surgery. And I used to think, he used to tell me like, oh, you know, it's my glands and I got problems. So I, I believed it when I was in my early 20s. And then I moved in, we were roommates for a couple of years, and the amount of food he would eat was just like, I, I, where I see people typically have weight problems is they find comfort in certain things. Sure. So for example, someone will eat, kind of get into the crunching of like chewing on a Dorito. Yep. And you eat a whole bag and it's 1300 calories. So if you ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you ate over your maintenance. Yeah. And then you're eating a bag of Doritos. Every three days, you're essentially putting a pure pound of fat on your body. Disgusting. Yeah. Think about what it does to your body. I mean. Oh, well, yeah. But then, you know, and then people are like, well, you know, I have digestive issues or I have hormone issues or I have insulin sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And it, it is true. Like, you know, some of my eating habits are, are, are not the best, but I maybe do it for a day. Sure. Or a couple of days a month, and I go, whoa, I got to catch myself. Yeah. You know, like, uh, but, yeah, I mean, if you're drinking a pure, a whole gallon of whole milk every two days to get your cinnamon toast crunch habit, you're going to be obese. <laughs> yeah. And that's what happens. Yeah, that's yeah. what happens. It's pretty, it's pretty one plus one equals two, right? Mm -hmm. But I look at that, and I, I have a severe problem with people um, that don't take care of their body because I think it's something that is very important. How you present yourself with an investor, with business, with your business. I mean, imagine if I was 60 pounds overweight, I'm an owner of a hormone clinic and a, and a health and wellness clinic. Who the fuck's going to listen to me? Nobody. 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 You have, to, you have to practice what you preach, and you have to put a good foot forward. So I think health and fitness is number one for people that want to be really successful. Yeah. If you take care of your body, your mind works better. If your mind works better, your money's going to work better. That's just how it is. Correct. You know? Yeah. I you know and, and it is really true and I mean kind of let's let's back this up and it's like I am not knocking anybody that has a weight problem. Sure. I mean, I think that everybody has their own demons to work with, but you really don't see any CEOs that are overweight. No. You really don't. They're all I mean, Tim Cook gets up at four o'clock in the morning to work out. And listen, you don't need to be ripped like Rambo. You don't need to have a physique like you. But you need, at least need to have a healthy appearance. And, you know, a, a lot of people also don't understand nutrition. People think, well, I'm going to eat a salad every day. Okay, well, salad has almost no, lettuce has almost no nutritional value. Yeah. And you're just going to eat essentially greasy fat with, a, with a, a dressing. You know, try like, you know, I, I, I laugh because, you know, people when I say like, hey, listen, eat like eight ounces of ground beef and like a cup of rice. They're like, I can eat that? I'm like, yeah. 
well, you know? I, people people got uh, shunned from eating, um, you know, beef products and things like that. It, it's the whole dietary system in the United States has went completely haywire. It's, it's a complete disaster. They're rating like sugary cereals over ground beef, <laughs> saying that's a better score. <laughs> Well, you know, the, like everybody got into. You know, oh, I love everyone's like, oh, I'm cu- all carbs, no carbs, no carbs. Uh, I go, you know, it, it was funny because I was I was talking to somebody that was like really depleted, and they're yeah, like, yeah. I'm depleted, and you know, I'm like, what are you doing? I'm eating nothing but protein, blah blah blah. I'm like, eat some carbs. Yeah. And then they go, oh my god, the water went away. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, listen. It's a uh, people. There's so much information out there. I think people get overwhelmed, and I think people don't really understand what to look for anymore. It's really simple. Your, your food is really simple. Eat whole foods. Try to eat processed foods. Single yeah. ingredient foods. If you're going to eat some fast food, don't do it every day. Don't eat bullshit every day. And eat square meals. Vegetables, proteins, a little bit of carbs or a starch or something like that. You're good to go. You know where people really hit the speed bump almost immediately is, let's say, for example, people think chicken is a healthy protein. Mm-hmm. Okay. It is a healthy protein. You and I have eaten millions of chicken meals. Millions of chickens. We have committed chicken genocide. Chicken genocide. <laughs> but but the whole thing is, okay, but for your first, you know, they go and they boil it. Boil chicken right off the bat. <sighs> no. Season it up with all the salt, pepper, everything you want in the very beginning. Get mm-hmm. the calories in. And then what do they do? They try to eat two cups of broccoli. Eat a multivitamin. It's like, you know, it's like, or eat like a little bit and then eat like one cup of white rice or mm-hmm. you know a cu- and then obviously then you kind of get used to the cadence of eating yeah but the problem is is everybody tries to go oh, a big piece of chicken boil big thing of broccoli bo- you know steamed and a big thing of rice it's tough to eat you know mm-hmm. yeah maybe four weeks out you're eating like that yeah and suffering yeah you're not eating like that like on a daily basis no you'll go crazy and that's why people that's what people think that's why people fail though that's what people miserably fail. yeah that's what people fail at it Listen, the, the the amount of information I think that young people can get from this kind of talk and this kind of podcast is invaluable stuff. Yeah. But I want to see something real quick. I want to see something very valuable that you have in your collection right there. Yeah, so... Yeah, no, <laughs> I need to see this. We need to, we need to show us I'm so camera. excited. I was able to bring these. So last December, I spent $1.3 million on a collection, and it had all like really rare, one-of-a-kind sneakers... And um, this was one of the most uh, expensive pairs that uh, I bought, got in the collection. It's a pair of Jordan 1, Doran Becker 1s. And um, it's one of a kind. Mm-hmm. It's the only size 9 in the world. And um, so the, the Doran Becker Children's Hospital is in Oregon. And uh, the Nike facility is pretty close to there. And what they do is they give... Uh, once a year, a dying child's wish to design their own sneaker. And it's everything typically that's a little bit different, but the one was more of like a commemorative pair. Got it. So what they did is they took all the pairs that were done over the last, I think it was maybe 10 years, and they put a piece of them, every one, in, in these um, in these shoes. So you can see that every piece of every different shoe is completely different. Look at the bottoms, too. I yeah, mean. I know, right? Yeah, so this one's for sale for 110000 um, hundred and ten thousand. Hundred and ten thousand. Yeah, and we every every year we probably sell about you know eight to ten pairs over like the fifty thousand dollar range. Got it. Because now people that were are in their you know thirties through their sixties have made some very big money over the years, and they're like, you know what? These are the modern day Picassos. And now are these are these that highly collectible? Like nobody's gonna wear these. No. So what the what these will do is they'll go into a glass case in somebody's basement. Got it. And it'll be essentially like a piece of art. Got it. But you know, the asset class is highly valuable to a lot of these collectors because they know that, hey, they're gonna sell it if they need the money. Yeah. It's like a piece of art. Sure. It's gonna take time to sell it, but you could sell it. But you know, the the really high high price possession right now are um like uh like the Travis Scott samples, like something Travis Scott wore to the Grammys, or yeah, like yeah, you get the Travis Scott olives, or um, so like we sold a pair of um Travis Scott purple friends and family where he wore to a Grammy. Oh, okay, Grammys. cool. So he's like actually out and got it, yeah. got it, got so it. So like Drake got a couple pairs of um these OVO 11s. They were all gold. And um, he was given like 11 pairs, so that pair was like 60,000. Wow. Um, 
there was the Jordan 4 Undefeated, which was um, designed in collaboration with the military, had a lot of like military uh, grade um, fabric that they sewed and stitched up, and they were like auctioned off. I think there was like 50 pairs. That pair was like 50 grand. That's cool. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there's, there's some really cool stuff, you know, and when money was flowing 2021, 2022, people were buying crazy stuff like that. Yeah. Now, right now, like our, our bread and butter expensive shoe is like, let's say a Jordan 1 Dior, which ranges from nine to 12,000, or like the Louis Vuitton Air Forces, which are seven to 10,000, depending on. I really, I need to find a pair of those. Oh, they're great. I need to find a pair of they're them. They're great. I know. Green I, I got 12. I gotta find a pair. Of yeah. them. I gotta find a pair of them. I'll find. I know. I know the guy. I know a guy. Yeah. No. You wanna know? They're, 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 it's really a great shoe. But yeah, that's a lot of people have been doing these these asset class sneakers. They just they've been blowing up. So we've been lucky enough to sell a lot of them. But our, our average tra- you know sneaker um, price you know transaction price is right around three hundred eighty dollars. Okay. Yeah. So relatively affordable. I mean, yeah. you know, But this is awesome sneakerhead stuff. Like this is this is awesome stuff. Yeah. You isn't know that what great? I mean? Yeah. This is great. So. Where can people find you on social media? Everybody knows Impossible Kicks. And anybody that doesn't know, it's at Impossible Kicks. I mean, <laughs> it's crazy if you don't know what this company is. But if you don't... Yeah, at Impossible Kicks, um, if you want to reach me, uh, at the real Johnny Mac. Uh, verified. 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 <laughs> authentically verified. And, um, yeah, you know, if you have any questions, reach out to me. Um, we're always looking for great people. We have stores from, like I said, in 11 different states mm-hmm. from... Hawaii, actually 12 different states now, from Hawaii all the way through to Connecticut. So, um, you know, if, if you're looking for, you know, management or a career in sneakers, you can hit me up. And, and, and coming up. to a cruise ship near you. Coming to a cruise ship near you. Fantastic. See how good he did that? Yeah. That was awesome. But I really, really had such a good time. So uh, no, thank you for coming on, on man. Yeah, I, I, think nice the value, I think the value from this podcast is going to be really good for everybody. I think people are going to understand it's not all glory, but the glory can come at the end, you know, because you really did it. You really embodied what entrepreneurship, the American dream, in my opinion, yeah. starting from nothing, working your way through, doing those hard sales is a hard job, you know, and building a company from zero, from zero to 60 million in three years. Wild. It's, it's wild when I think about congratulations. it. Congratulations. Yeah, it's it's thank amazing. You. Thank really you for coming it. on. Yeah, no thank problem, you for man. sharing everything with us, man. And listen, uh, we'll do it again soon. Absolutely. Yeah.